Live from Boston, I'm Emilio Madrigal. Today is Tuesday, June 2, 2020. I am joined remotely by my good friend, Rifat Manan, who is in Philadelphia right now. And we are very happy to welcome back Dr. Drusilla Roberts for a placental pathology lecture. Dr. Roberts is an associate professor of pathology at the world-class teaching hospital of Harvard Medical School, Mass General Hospital. And actually, I'm very lucky to be a colleague of Dr. Roberts right here at uh, Mass General. Today's podcast is titled Categories of Placental Pathology Part 2, and it's being streamed live on Facebook, YouTube, and Periscope. As always, please remember that you can ask questions during the session by simply typing those questions as comments in the Facebook and YouTube chat windows. And Rafan and I will make sure to pass those questions and comments along at the end of the broadcast. So with that, I'll just go ahead and turn the microphone over to Dr. Roberts. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, in these difficult and troubling times, it's kind of nice to take in a little escape to the placenta and um, not think about um, hard things. So we'll try to talk about some placental pathologies that we didn't get to last time. And let me just go ahead and then start with the first case. Um, and it's severe IUGR at term. And here's the placenta at really low power. And even at this power, you can kind of see there's these clumps of villi that look blue. And if we go in and look at some of these villi, the reason why they look blue is that you don't see any blood vessels filled with fetal blood. There is this alive birth, so you can still see that there is blood in, in the, the stem villi, but the secondary and tertiary villi are uh, vessels are occluded, and you can even see some avascular villi associated with these villi. And these villi are very hypercellular. You can see all these blue cells in them that are histiocytes and T cells. Um, so this is present diffusely throughout the placenta. And sometimes, it, like in this case, it's so striking that it is hard to imagine that this fetus could survive this because there's very few vi functioning villi left. We used to call this kind of feature um, with all the avascular villi combined with this feature, which is diffuse, chronic villitis as obliterative chronic villitis because it has downstream fetal vascular malperfusion. But this is chronic villitis. And whenever you see chronic villitis, you have to look carefully to see if there's anything that makes you think that it could be an infectious chronic villitis. Um, it's very rare, but you know, about less less than 5% of chronic validities are infectious in origin, but you don't want to miss those. And some of the hints are if it's diffuse, like in this case, if you see um, a pattern of the velitis where the inflammation is mainly sub-trophoblastic, uh, this is diffuse throughout the villi. And if you see unusual cell types other than histiocytes and mononuclear T cells, so if you see plasma cells or giant cells, or if you see hemosiderin. So you should always kind of pass around. So here's a little bit of intervillicitis and see if you see anything that makes you worried about an infectious phyllitis. And the most common one would be CMV. And only 10% of, of CMV placentitis can you see the inclusions. So you, you have to be suspicious based on the H&E histology. But this doesn't have any of the features that are worrisome other than its diffuseness for an infectious phyllitis. So nowadays, um, due to the uh, Amsterdam criteria, we grade phyllitis as low grade or high grade. And hopefully you would also put in the diagnosis whether it's multifocal or diffuse if it's high grade. So this is clearly high grade. There are more than 10 contiguous villi involved in the process. There is more than one focus. And what I haven't shown you is that it has to be on more than one slide. So you can have high grade villitis that's patchy um, 
with a lot of normal villi in between, but this is quite diffuse. So this would be uh, villitis of unknown etiology, high grade, diffuse. Low grade is less than 10 villi in any focus, and you need to have more than one focus uh, present to, to call it. So you would have just, you know, like this many villi and a couple of foci of it to call it low grade. And then there's another criteria, there's another category, which is ungradable, which means if you just have one focus of maybe three or four villi, um, or even one focus of 10 villi, but only one focus, uh, then it's called um, VUE or Velitis of Unknown Etiology, um, ungradable. And then you decide whether you favor it being a high grade if you had more samples, or if you favor it being low grade. So the validities that cause problems are these high grade ones. And that's because of this interruption of fetal blood flow and the cytokines and uh, uh, other factors released by the inflammatory cells into the fetal bloodstream. And um, so these are the ones you need to worry about. Certainly this could cause the growth restriction in this case. And um, let me go back to my PowerPoint. to go over a little bit more about chronic velitis. So it's a, a mixed maternal and fetal inflammatory infiltrate. So the histiocytes are predominantly fetal and the T cells are predominantly maternal, but there are a lot of maternal histiocytes in there as well. Uh, it is associated with morbidity and mortality. And as I said, most are not infectious, they're idiopathic, and we, are, we think they're immuno immunologically based because they recur in future pregnancies in about a third of the cases. And so we call those velitis of unknown etiology. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, discussion about whether VUE is really an infection that we just haven't been able to determine the etiology of it, or if it really is immunologically based. Um, the infections that cause chronic velitis are classically the torch infections. And as I said, most of the time it's CMV. It's associated with IUGR, so growth restriction, fetal demise, or stillbirth. And in live births, it's been associated with the central pattern of, of central nervous system injury. So it's, it's uh, associated with bad things in, in live births. Although most babies with VUE do, do all right. They might be small and they may have a little bit of uh, developmental delay, but they're not uh, catastrophically um, injured, but um, they can be. Uh, it's fairly common. So in our population, we see about 5% of VUE in all placentas. In other populations, um, it's higher. And if, you, um, if you're just looking, you know, if, if your collection of placentas is just IUGR or just stillbirth, it's going to be even higher than 15%. So about a third of these recur, but those that recur often progress. So you might start out with one pregnancy um, that term that has low-grade chronic velitis or low-grade VUE. And then the next pregnancy, you get high-grade VUE at 37 weeks. And the next pregnancy, you get IUGR or IUFD with diffuse VUE at 28 weeks. So they present earlier and progress. Um, and here's the uh, grading cate um, categorization that I went over um, and then the pattern. So when do you need to worry about chronic velitis? When there are features suspicious for an infectious velitis? So most VUEs occur at term. So if you see velitis preterm, it's a red flag that something is going on and that you really should worry about an infection. Whether it's diffuse, like the case we just saw, and then when it has other features, which we'll see a little bit later, but any of these other features would suggest uh, an infectious velitis. You need to worry about velitis causing morbidity when it's high grade or diffuse, when it's recurrent, or when you see any velitis in an otherwise small placenta. So when you get chronic velitis, the, the um, provider needs to be alert that it could be, even though we don't see anything, it still could be an infectious velitis and use their clinical judgment to rule in or rule out CMV. But we need to review previous obstetric pathology to see if this is recurrent. 
Okay, so let's go to the next case. Case two is another growth restriction, but mom, this time mom has uh, autoimmune disease. And I have four uh, sections of placenta here. And you can see even at this power that one of them is very pink and one of them is very blue. So let's go to the pink one first. So the reason why it's pink is there's, there's a lot of fibrin. Whenever you see a lot of fibrin, you should look in the intervillous space to see what the cellularity is in the mom's space. And you can see that there's a lot of uh, nucleated cells that are kind of big. These are all histiocytes. And histiocytes in the intervillous space is unusual. If you have chronic velitis, then it's just the associated intervillocytis that you sometimes see. But in the absence of chronic velitis, uh, histiocytes in the intervillous space is a worrisome feature for a disorder called chronic histiocytic intervillocytis. So let's go back out and um, look at the bluer one. So we have too many histiocytes in the intervillous space associated with increased perivillous fibrin. And here you can, you can see the spattering of histiocytes in the uh, intervillous space associated with fibrin. So in these cases, um, the differential diagnosis is just intervillocytis, but we have no chronic colitis in this case. So then you really have to worry about this entity called chronic histiocytic intervillocytis. And she's got a risk factor in that she's got an autoimmune disease. So let's um, let's learn a little bit about chronic histiocytic intervillocytis. And you can see that you it's one of the things you always have to do when you look at the placenta is look in the intervillous space um, to see what's circulating in mom. Um, and that's because you're going to look for uh, infectious things, in, inflammatory things, malignant things, and um, hematologic things. So it's always worth, uh, you always should look in several places in the intervillous space um, to see what's going on there. So um, let's go here. So why is this an important diagnosis? It causes pregnancy losses at any gestational age, but supposedly in the literature, it's more common in the first trimester. That's not my experience, because usually I see it in the second and third trimester. It's associated with losses that have a normal karyotype, and it has a very high recurrence rate. And the histology is that the maternal space is filled or has very many histiocytes and in, uh, intervillous fibrin. It's got morbidity and mortality associations um, with neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia in the babies. It is associated with some chromosomal anomalies, but mainly with IUGR, so fetal growth restriction. Some skeletal anomalies probably related to the growth restriction. They have, there's a high perinatal mortality rate, so not just stillbirths, but neonatal mortality rate, and a high spontaneous abortion rate and it's been associated with preterm delivery. So maternal, again, pregnancy losses at any gestational age. Moms often have autoimmune disease or hypertension, but it's associated with a very elevated maternal serum alkaline phosphatase, two and a half times or more the normal range. So it's a very um, uh, supportive feature if you're thinking that you could have chronic histiocytic intervillocytis. Um, so we think the etiology, again, is a rejection phenomenon because of this association with autoimmune disease and because it recurs, but it has been associated with a myriad of different, usually rare, infectious etiologies which should be um, evaluated. And there is one uh, SARS-CoV-2 case that has been described with chronic histiocytic intervillocytis. So it's worth checking mom's history for uh, infectious etiologies. You should worry about it when you see clusters of histiocytes in the maternal space with or without admixed fibrin, 
review previous OB pathology. So if you're looking at a placenta from a growth-restricted baby or a stillbirth and you see histiocytes, and then you look up mom's history and she's had two or three other losses, pull those losses and look because it could be pretty subtle, uh, especially in the first trimester. You should never see histiocytes in the intervilla space in the first trimester. So that's a, a very important pathology to see. And the recurrence risk is very high Although one report says about 18%, that's still pretty high. Other reports say up to 100%. Uh, and there has been some anecdotal treatment successes with a variety of therapies, IVIG, low molecular weight heparin, aspirin, and prednisone. Um, when you think you have chronic histiocytic intervillocytis, I really like to have some um, supportive features, like the ALK-FOS elevation, um, the uh, history of autoimmune disease in mom or bad pregnancy history with lots of losses. And you need to inform both clinicians, the pediatrician and the obstetrician in these cases. So that's chronic histiocytic intervillocytis. And um, let's go to the next case. So this is growth restriction with oligohydramnios and fetal cystic renal dysplasia. And you can see at low power in this slide, here's the chorionic plate, the fetal surface, and this is the maternal surface, the basal plate. And you can see that there's this thick rind of pink material all along this maternal floor. And what is this? So these are infarcted villi because there's fibrin surrounding them. This time there's no intervillocytis. You just see this pink fibrin and these necrotic villi. There's more than, um, so there's always a little bit of fibrin on the maternal floor, but you should never see more than three generations of uh, villi entrapped in that fibrin, and it should never be a, a band-like um, uh, process along the maternal floor. This is something that you can see grossly. And so when I see this on a slide, so I don't gross all my placentas. I, we have re residents and pathology assistants who do the grossing. I'll look to see what how they describe the maternal floor. Did they say that the maternal floor was smooth and yellow or thick? Um, and how much of the placenta was involved? Um, if I only have one slide with this feature, I always go back and look at the placenta myself to see how much of the placenta is involved by this process. So this is called maternal floor infarct. In some places, it's, it's uh, also called massive perivillous fibrin deposition. It's probably the same um, pathology, just uh, geographically different. So you have this band of fibrin along the maternal floor and you can see how it can cause problems because mom's blood is coming up here and it can't get through to perfuse these villi. So these villi always look really cachectic and they're getting perfused by kind of like collateral flow from where there is no maternal floor infarct. So unfortunately it's a, it's a bad name because it's not really an infarction. It's, it's, they are infarcted villi, but they're, they're smothered or suffocated by all this fibrin. Um, this is a rare phenomenon. Uh, it's almost always associated with a bad outcome, like in this case. Um, and let's see what other features are associated with, with um, maternal floor infarction or massive perivillous fibrin deposition. So first let's look at a massive perivillous fibrin deposition case. So this is clearly at a margin. And usually at a margin, there's some fibrin. And we kind of ignore it because it's always a kind of a poorly perfused area. So it's slow flow and there's a lot of fibrin. But this was described as diffusely throughout the placenta. And so again, what you see are dead villi encased in all this fibrin. And it's transmural through the whole uh, thickness of the, of the placental section. So this is another time that I would review the maternal his the, the sorry the gross description of the placenta to see how big this process was, what percentage of the placenta was involved, 
And I always go back and I look at the placenta myself because if it's just a focus, it's not so worrisome. But if it's 25% of the placenta that's involved with this process, then it's very worrisome. And you can see that intervillous intermediate trophoblasts or extravillous trophoblasts likes to grow in fibrin. So you'll always see a lot of, of uh, cellularity to this fibrin, especially if it's been there a long time. So, um, so this is probably, and it's hard to know just based on one slide, but massive perivillous fibrin deposition. So let's go see, you learn a little bit about massive perivillous fibrin deposition and maternal floor infarct. So here's the gross of maternal floor infarct. And you can see this is the maternal surface. Over here we have cotyledons. So these, this is pretty normal. But over here we have this yellow band of thick material just uh, effacing the, um, the cotyledons. So this is uh, fibrin. And on a cut section, you can see the thick band of fibrin that should be more than three millimeters thick. Uh, and it should involve at least 25% of the placenta to be worried about it. And usually you get, you know, poor perfusion of the villi um, proximal to the baby from this uh, maternal floor infarct. Here's massive perivillous fibrin deposition. So it looks different because the fibrin is so diffuse and it's not just along the maternal floor it's involving the whole placenta. And here you can see a cut section where you see this kind of interlacing fibrin and these little nodules of normal placenta that are trying to keep this baby uh, alive. So most of the placenta, like 50% of this placenta is involved by this fibrin deposition. So maternal floor infarct is that regional along the maternal floor, the basal plate. Um, it's been associated with losses. Um, at any gestational age, very high association with fetal growth restriction, uh, neonatal deaths, even uh, so perinatal deaths altogether. It has been associated with renal tubular dysgenesis, like in this case, um, with bad neurologic outcomes. It has a high recurrence rate, although not as high as chronic histiocytic intervillicitis, and it has been associated with an elevated maternal serum alpha feta protein. You really have to look at the gross to make the diagnosis, and it's said to look like an orange rind on the maternal floor. And it has to be at least three millimeters thick or involve more than three generations of villi. Um, this is a very nice paper that I recommend where they um, classify maternal floor infarct or massive perivillous fibrin deposition into three categories. So classic is the maternal floor infarct, borderline is um, at least 25% and transmural is greater than 50% on the villi. Now they base it on one slide. I base it on the whole placenta because one slide you can just still have regional fibrin and unless you've seen the whole placenta you don't know um, how diffuse the process is. So it's an overdiagnosed phenomenon and I think that's based on that people don't go back and look at the placenta themselves it's a really a rare diagnosis, but it has these bad associations uh, and recurrence rates. Um, so here's my criteria for the diagnosis of maternal floor infarct, massive perivillous fibrin deposition. I used the Faye Peterson and Ernst for first trimester cases. I review the gross placenta if it's intact. Um, I uh, expect to see at least 25% of the placenta involved by either process to make the diagnosis and 50 of a borderline, and 50% needs to be involved to make a full diagnosis. It's one of those diagnoses that uh, is a phone call because of these associations. It explains a bad outcome. You want to let them know that they should check mom for thrombophilias. Uh, there is this association with Coxsackie viral infection, so you need to see if the clinical story supports that or the baby's outcome. Um, and other immune disorders in mom, um, including these listed here. Um, fetal and obstetric growth restriction, oligohydramnios, preterm birth, these renal disorders, and it's unclear how massive perivillous fibrin deposition causes this, but it must be some poor perfusion or poor oxygenation. Um, 
It is associated with umbilical cord findings, which is also kind of unusual, hypercoiled or single umbilical artery, and then um, perinatal morbidity and mortality. So it's either caused by a rejection-like phenomenon, again, because it's been associated with um, uh, these features of rejection and it has a high recurrence rate, but other groups have found that it's been associated with um, pro and anti-angiogenic factor imbalance, like you see in preeclampsia, although it is not associated with an increased prevalence of um, preeclampsia. So when you have, uh, um, what is a differential diagnosis? And it's very important because most fibrin that you see in the placenta is benign. And it's just a fibrin plaque or regional increased perivillous fibrin. Um, it can look like an infarct, but in a regular infarct, the villi will touch each other and there'll be no fibrin between them. So you really need to look at infarcts to see if it's due to perivillous fibrin or if it's just due to poor, no perfusion. At the margin, as I said, it's very common to see fibrin deposition. So if, if your lesion is restricted to the margin, it's probably benign. Um, you always see it with circummarginate and circumvallate placentation. And in first trimester cases, it's associated with mesoprostol, so failed medical abortions, or retained placentas, retained um, uh, SABs, or retained placentas. They'll always get a lot of perivillous fibrin deposition, so be cautious making the diagnosis with those histories. So when is fibrin too much? When you can see it grossly, even if it's just a plaque, it's a diagnosis. Um, but if it fills, if you're looking at your slides and it fills the slide from basal plate to chorionic plate, even focally, it's worrisome and you should consider looking at the placenta yourself. And then again, if you see it preterm, it's unusual. Uh, so it's a red flag that you might be dealing with this. The clinician needs to consider getting confirmatory serum markers, rule out Coxsackie as an infectious cause, Moms need to be evaluated for autoimmune disease and thrombophilia, and you should inform the pediatrician for this um, prevalence of um, renal disorders and uh, perinatal morbidity and mortality. Okay, so that's it for disorders that recur that you need to know about. So let's talk a little bit about placental infections. Um, we'll see how how much I can get through in the next half hour. But as you all know, the most common placental infection is chorioamnionitis, and that's thought to be due in most part due to um, uh, transcervical um, uh, colonization of the amniotic fluid from cervical vaginal flora. Uh, you can also get chorioamnionitis from oral flora um, that gets in um, uh, hematogenously. Other hematogenous infections include anything that's in the mom's blood will seed the placenta. So viremia, bacteremia, um, parasitemia will infect the blood, but um, and that can get into the amniotic fluid, but this is the most common is acute chorioamnionitis. Now the fetus can get infected by direct blood infection in the placenta or by swallowing and aspirating um, the infected amniotic fluid. So we call these ascending or transplacental uh, routes of infection. And they have different histopathologies, which is why it's uh, important to kind of categorize them this way. So ascending infections, again, are vag cervical vaginal flora. Um, they can either cause or be a sequelae of ruptured membranes. They're associated with maternal fever, fetal tachycardia, the placenta is yellow-green, uh, and the cord can become yellow-green. And the histology, you have to remember to look for both compartments of the placenta for evidence of involvement by the infectious process, maternal and fetal components. So here's chorioamnionitis. You have a dull yellow-green placenta, and also the umbilical cord is discolored. They should be white, and this one's kind of yellow-green. Here's another one that's quite yellow with a yellow umbilical cord. Uh, so these are uh, chorioamnionitis, ascending infection. Most of the inflammatory cells that you see in the membranes are maternal, um, and they're mixed inflammatory, but mainly leukocytes, uh, neutrophils. Um, 
in the chorionic epithelium to the amniotic epithelium. Fetal involvement, you'll see immature neutrophils and eosinophils migrating from the umbilical or chorionic plate vessels. And nowadays we grade and stage, sorry, stage them based on this paper from 2003 that was re-reviewed in the Amsterdam criteria. So here's a, um, an amnion from a chorioamnionitis case, which is stage two because you see inflammatory cells in the soft tissue between the amnion and the chorion, and it's probably still just a grade one. Here's a fetal inflammatory response. Here's a fetal umbilical vein, and you can see the inflammatory cells marginating and then migrating through the smooth muscle. So this would be, if it's only the vein involved, a stage one, and it's still just a grade one. Here's the effect of amniotic, ascending amniotic fluid infections. This is fetal lung with uh, uh, neutrophils in the developing airways and some inflammatory cells in the interstitium. And here's the esophagus with neutrophils from swallowing. So acute chorioamnionitis preterm is always infectious or nearly always infectious at term. Um, it's rare and it can be related to other things, although this is controversial, um, but it does cause fever and labor. But apparently, and in all reports, there's always some that are um, apparently sterile, so due to something else, um, at least not to any bacteria or organism that we can identify even molecularly. You can culture the placenta by peeling the amnion off the chorion and then taking a little bit of chorion or swabbing the chorionic plate. Uh, and, and that's the way to culture the placenta for organisms. Transplacental infections are much rarer. They're due to maternal sepsis, viremia and parasitemia, et cetera. The outcome is based on the gestational age of the infection in the organism, and the histology is quite different. So you don't get a chorioamnionitis, you get an inflammation of the villi or a villitis. So this, just like we saw before, you can get a chronic villitis, but this time it's an infectious chronic villitis and not villitis of unknown etiology. Again, these are mainly maternal inflammatory infiltrates of the chorionic villi, but also fetal inflammatory response occurs um, and associated with um, bad outcome. Um, most, are, most chronic villages, as we discussed, are idiopathic and they can recur in future pregnancies, but a small percentage of, of them are due to infections classically of the torch kind. And here's chronic villitis again, which is quite diffuse. Here's a more subtle chronic villitis. So in inflammatory cells, you don't see any um, open capillaries in these villi and you see increased uh, small blue cells in the villi. Here's one that's got an intervillicitis component associated with it. And here's, so I've been showing you chronic villitis. You can also get acute villitis with uh, neut uh, neutrophils in the uh, villi in the intervillous space. These are classically listeria or group B strep infections, um, but you can also see them in tuberculosis and in syphilis. So chronic colitis that are infectious usually have atypical features that we discussed before, plasma cells, neutrophils, giant cells. Um, they are diffuse and often necrotizing, and you often see hemocytorin in the villi, and you can see involvement of the chorionic plate. So let's go look at some cases. So this one is severe IUGR at term. There's a lot of dots on the slide, that's a big hint. So if we go, uh, it's, it's not very red. So here's the red, you should be seeing a lot of red in these villi. So that's the one first thing you notice is it's not very red. Uh, and then you see that the, it, there's a very cellular villi, so there's an infiltrate in the, in the villi. The villi seem to be a little expanded and pink, so uh, this is a late preterm um, gestation. And the, the cellular component of the villi looks okay. They look like um, T cells, but then you start to see that circulating in some of the villi 
are immature cells, blast forms. So immature red blood cells and a lot of uh, white blood cells. So you're already on alert. So it's, um, it's not a term gestation. You have big pink villi that, and a diffuse villitis and you have a lot of uh, fetal uh, immature cells circulating. So now you're gonna be looking around to see if you see anything that makes you think that it could be infectious. And so let me try to make it over to my dots. So here's a villus that's big and pink and expanded with a lot of uh, inflammatory cells. And then what do you see here? This brown pigment, hemosiderin. And I have another focus of hemosiderin. Hemosiderin in the villi is like almost pathognomonic for um, CMV placentitis. So let me see, I thought I had another dot. So whenever you see um, big pink villi, hemosiderin, and uh, a diffuse process with immature cells circulating, you really have to think about CMV. So I don't know if I'll be able to find it for you, but here's some more hemosiderin. And you can see that in this case, there are no inclusions. So your suspicion is based totally on the h and &E pathology. Even if you got an immunohistochemical stain, it could be negative and it's still CMV placentitis. So that's what this case is. Uh, it's CMV placentitis. I would sign it out as highly suspicious for, I would make a phone call to the pediatrician to test the baby and to the um, obstetrician to test the mom. Because the sooner you can make the diagnosis of um, CMV, congenital CMV, the better the outcome. So let's look at another case. This is an IUFD at 20 weeks and mom is 13. So at low power, what you see is that there are some edematous villi, right? And then you start to see the very blue cellular infiltrate. And then necrosis. So 20 weeks with, um, with chronic velitis is very, suspicious for an infection. And here you can see a inclusion right there. So this is CMV placentitis that was a high enough viral load to cause an IUFD. And this is probably, uh, uh, um, this is a relatively easy case to diagnose because you can see that there are the inclusions and because it's such an early gestation. If you didn't see inclusions in this case, the fact that you have chronic velitis at 20 weeks is really unusual. And you have a spectrum of pathology from the inflamed villi to the avascular villi. So um, you have an obliterative velitis. Um, and the villi are expanded. And another thing that I don't know if I'll be able to convince you, but one of the things that is common is the inflammation tends to be subtrophoblastic and a big pink um, expanded, and here's the hemosiderin uh, villus. That's very characteristic of, of CMV. And there are nucleated red blood cells, but she's only 20 weeks, and that's probably um, just uh, developmental and not pathologic. So this case is another case of, of congenital CMV. And Let's see a little bit about CMV placentitis. Because it causes, it characteristically causes a villus stromal expansion. So big pink villi with subtrophoblastic inflammation, you really worry about CMV. Hemosiderin, it's just, 
it's CMV until proven otherwise. Um, the surface necrosis that we saw is very characteristic. It's very often associated with a plasma cell deciduitis, but this is rather nonspecific, so you have to see it in association with these things to be worried. Normal blastemia, immature red blood cells circulating, and it's associated with chorionic plate vascular thromboses. A lot of uh, viral infections in the placenta are associated with vascular thromboses in the chorionic plate. So here's another example, big pink eye, the sub trophoblastic necrosis and collection of the inflammation. And you can see the inclusions even at this power. You don't need the arrows, uh, but again, look, it's not very in inflamed, but it's big and pink and expanded. Here's a chorionic plate vascular thrombus that's calcified. Um, Again, this is a feature of fetal vascular malperfusion, but when you see uh, chorionic plate vascular thromboses with chronic phyllitis, you have to really be worried about an infectious phyllitis. And then what is really scary is the chronicity of the infection really um, makes a difference in the, in the presence or absence of chronic phyllitis. So here's a very early case, and I just had one recently um, where there was no chronic phyllitis. Um, but you can see the uh, infected cells. So it was a very recent infection of CMV and it can still be catastrophic for the baby. So babies who die from CMV, are it's rare and it usually means a high viral load. And you should consider evaluation in this country for HIV. So the histopathologic findings, again, are lymphoplasmacytic phyllitis, chlorosis of the villus capillaries, chorionic vessel thromboses, necrotizing velitis, hemosiderin, normal blastemia, and remember that the absence of viral inclusions does not negate the diagnosis because they're only present in about 10% of cases. All right, let's see another infection. This one says high drops fetalis at 27 weeks. So, um, All infectious validities can cause high drops. It's one of the things you have to worry about when you when you see uh, when you're working up high drops. But there are some that are very characteristically associated with high drops. So in this case, uh, what you see even at this power, there's a lot of nucleated cells circulating in the fetal circulation, and really there it's an immature-looking placenta, but there's not a really chronic phyllitis. And here you can start to see. These, um, the, the, there's peripheralization of the chromatin in these blast forms. So everyone should know what this is. Let's try to find some more. Here's, a, here's one that has the kind of glassy inclusion. So this is parvovirus. I just wanted to show an example of a, a congenital infection that doesn't really have a pronounced um, chronic phyllitis, but it's definitely a viral infection. And uh, just another reason why you should always look at not only what's circulating in mom, but what's circulating in baby. And um, you can see all the blast forms uh, present. So um, parvovirus uh, usually has a story with it. Like often the moms have a toddler at home or work in childcare. Um, and the toddler was sick recently. Moms usually have very mild symptoms, uh, if any, and so it's a very uh, important diagnosis for the clinicians to worry about in uh, that kind of clinical situation, and it very often uh, is associated with high drops. So this is parvovirus infection in the placenta. So this is an, an IUFD at 19 weeks. So we have an immature placenta. And you start to see some, infl here's a good one, inflammation in the villi.
And these cells are fragmented necrotic neutrophils. So this is acute velitis. Remember what I said about acute velitis. There's really only two things, common things, and again, they're still rare, that cause acute velitis, and that's listeria and group B strep. And they have a little different pattern. Listeria um, makes abscesses, and group B strep makes just small clusters or single villi uh, inflamed. Here's another one. So this is looking to me more like group B strep than listeria. And this case has, you can't get high enough, but these are intravascular organisms. So this is evidence of fetal sepsis. And here's the inflammation, but these are intravascular organisms. So this was group B strep with intravascular organisms. And this is an important diagnosis to make. I mean, you've explained the IUFD. Um, but intravascular organisms is associated with bad outcomes on mom as well. So it's a phone call to the clinicians because moms can be very sick and there are even reported cases of maternal, maternal deaths from sepsis from uh, group B strep. And now if we go up here, you can see that there's a really high stage and grade um, maternal acute chorioamnionitis associated with this. Uh, acute velitis. So that's a very common feature that you can see with group B strep um, infections. So that's a, a case of uh, acute velitis due to group B strep. Uh, let's see, IUGR at term. Here's a placenta piece that it looks like there's something going on here. And it's another uh, collection of acute inflammatory cells. So this is an abscess. Um, most of the cells are in the intervillous space, but they also spill into the uh, villi. And so this is a microscopic abscess. You can also get macroscopic abscesses. And so this is pretty much pathognomonic for listeria. They often also have an acute chorioamnionitis, but not always. So in this case, there wasn't. Um, uh, babies are often not very sick or they are terribly sick. And if you can make the diagnosis grossly, by seeing abscesses and make a phone call saying, I see abscesses in the placenta. My differential diagnosis includes listeria. It's very helpful to the clinicians and to the microbiology lab. Um, the rest of the villi in this case were, were normal. So let's look at a little bit about listeria, listerial infections of the placenta. So here's um, an example of multiple abscesses in the placenta. So these are soft. Uh, yellow, small, irregular shaped masses. And the placenta has a fruity odor uh, that is quite characteristic for listeria. Uh, here's a multiple microscopic abscesses in uh, this listerial um, placentitis, a little bit higher power like we just saw in our case. And here you can see the intervillus uh, neutrophils and the villus neutrophils of the uh, of the abscess. You can see organisms, they're kind of hard to find. This is a, a Dieterle stain. They're said to look like kanji or Japanese or Chinese characters. Um, you can see fragments of them, again, associate, often associated with a chorioamnionitis, and the organisms like to grow in the amnion as well. The organisms like to grow or can grow in the cold. So if you don't, if you refrigerate your placentas before examining them, or if there's any delay, it can very much overgrow, and you can see abundant um, listeria organisms. So that's listeria. The next case is something that we don't see very often in this country, but. It's a common it's, um, finding in many parts of the world. And with travel, we're seeing more of it. So this was a story of a mom uh, with 
uh, HELP syndrome, and that's why we looked at the placenta. And this was a diagnosis made on placental examination. So at this power, what you see in the intervillous space, there's too many nucleated cells. So the differential diagnosis just at this power would be some like leukemic infiltrate, chronic histiocytic intervillicitis, or what it turns out to be. Now you can start to see pigment in some of the histiocytes that are circulating. And I think I can't go any higher. You can see pigment in the red blood cells. So this is malarial sequestration. So this is evidence of a massive malarial infection that becomes, see, here you can see the better, the parasitized red blood cells that become sequestered to the intervillous space. This is almost unique to mom's first malarial infection during pregnancy. And there are receptors that are secreted and on the trophoblasts uh, that sequester the malaria, uh, the infected red blood cells in the placenta. And so mom's parasite load uh, in her peripheral blood might not be that high, and that's because all the infected red blood cells are being sequestered here. These have a, a really bad outcome for mom and baby, growth restriction, fetal demise. Moms um, are very, very sick. Um, they, it, it is associated with an increased risk for development of hypertension in pregnancy like this woman had. Um, you can see the pigment here, so you know that this infection has been around for a little bit. It's not totally acute, and you can see some pigment in the fibrin as well. So this is an acute on chronic or chronic active infection of, of malaria. It's in the differential diagnosis of chronic histiocytic intervillicitis because you have a lot of histiocytes, but you have to look, and once you see the pigment, then the diagnosis is easy. So this is malarial sequestration. And now we have a preterm IUFD and I give you umbilical cord. So it's a big hint. Like there's a, just a few things that like to go to the umbilical cord. And one of them is toxo. So you should always look in your umbilical cord, especially in cases of stillbirth or IUGR, or sick babies, to look to see if you have like cellularity. So you shouldn't really have cellularity in the umbilical cord in Wharton's jelly. It should be posse-cellular. And you can see a lot of cells kind of percolating through here. And um, now comes the hard part for me is convincing you that some of these cells are the cis form. Here's, you can start to see them in here of the uh, of toxo. Toxo is very lethal, depending on the gestational age they get it, but it's almost always associated with demise. So you have to at least explain the demise when you make the diagnosis. I know in here there's some a beautiful example of the of the cysts if I can find it, but you guys all believe me, right? The main hint is that you see a lot of cells in in the Wharton's jelly that are kind of big. Um, and so the differential diagnosis would be um, meconium and uh, just neutrophil infiltrate from a fetal inflammatory response and uh, toxo. I'm not finding those beautiful examples that I saw earlier. So this is toxo. It likes to grow in Wharton's jelly for some reason. It's unclear, but it's a good place to look for infections in, uh, in IUFDs, especially preterm IUFDs, and um, it's often associated with high drops. So I have some better pictures because, um, so it, it's also associated with a phyllitis, a granulomatous type phyllitis, um, often with, again, chorionic plate vascular thromboses. And you can see this free trophozoites and the cyst forms in the villi, amniotic epithelium, chorion, but they're easiest to see in the umbilical cord. And here's one example. Here's another blurry example at higher power. And here's an example in the amnion. And here's the chorionic plate vascular thrombosis. So again, when you see 
Um, this by itself, it's just fetal vascular malperfusion, but when you see this associated with chronic velitis, that's when you have to worry about an infectious velitis. And then the last case, which I have five minutes um, to show you, I'm sorry I talk so much, is another preterm IUFD. And again, what I'm giving you is umbilical cord, umbilical cord and membrane roll, and there are dots. Um, so in this case, the hint about what's going on here is the cell type in the umbilical cord. So you start to see like too many cells in Wharton's jelly, and these are plasma cells. I can't get much higher. Plasma cells in Wharton's jelly are really, really unusual. And again, it's it's like hemocytin in the villi and CMV. Plasma cells in Wharton's jelly is uh, herpes, HSV, until proven otherwise. So the hint that this was herpes, there was also a rip roaring diffuse chronic velitis, but that there are plasma cells in, in the, uh, in the, in the um, Wharton's jelly. So um, usually babies who have congenital herpes are very sick and uh, it's clinically um, evident. So the pathologist's role is mainly in, in evaluating stillbirths or losses um, for herpes. So it's uh, can cause it be caused by primary HSV one or two, and it's a transplacental infection, often clinically silent. Mom won't have lesions yet, but can is viremic and passes the virus onto the placenta. Um, and usually, again, there's an um, IUFD with obvious clinical infection, marked chronic velitis with abundant plasma cells in the villi, chorion, decidua and in the umbilical cord. And here's the velitis that you often see. Um, so very striking chronic velitis with a lot of plasma cells in it, but not those pink expanded villi that you see um, with uh, CMV. It's very rare to see the inclusions in herpes, but you can. Here's the decidua with a lot of plasma cells. Again, this is a, a nonspecific finding, but it's, it, it's the company it keeps. When you have plasma cell deciduitis and plasma cell chronic velitis, then you really think about herpes or CMV. And here's a, a, a plasma cell in um, Wharton's jelly. Um, here's an example of an IUFD that had a ton of at least viral protein in umbilical cord and all this necrotic debris, which was stained positive by the immunohistochemistry. And maybe I'll stop there so that I can answer some questions. Um, thanks a lot for your attention, and I hope this was uh, interesting and, and informative. Emilio, are you there? Are there any uh, questions? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Roberts. That was an awesome, awesome presentation. Thank you for sharing all those interesting cases with us. Um, I have a nice uh, comment that I want to read to you. It comes from uh, one of the folks watching on Facebook. Uh, their name is Ambarish Fati, and they say that said, they said, thank you for walking us through a less traveled avenue of pathology, an amazing eye-opener. Um, oh. In reference to your lecture, obviously, so yeah, that was... That was yeah, less traveled, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so let me see, there are a few questions here, and um, so we can get started with some of them. Uh, so somebody asked, um, can we, this is from someone on YouTube, they said, they asked, can we use IHC for uh, like something like anti-CMV antibody? I guess in reference to one of the, one of the slides that you showed. Yeah, you can use the IHC, but again, if it's negative, it doesn't totally rule it out. So it's really an H and A diagnosis. Okay. But sometimes you're surprised and you do the IHC and there's a ton of it and you just didn't see the inclusions, you know, on the H and E. So it, it's always worth worth trying, but a negative result that doesn't exclude the, the diagnosis. Right, right. And I guess that's yeah, so that same person they asked, is HSV antibody relevant in orange jelly? Is HSV relevant or Right. That's that was the question. Okay, yeah. For sure, I would do um, HSV if if you have a diffuse 
if you're working up a stillbirth and you have a diffuse chronic colitis with a lot of plasma cells um, and chorionic plate vascular thromboses and uh, you know I would do both CMV and HSV on that placenta if that's all you have if you have the autopsy usually you're going to find the inclusions in the liver or the lung uh, and you're going to have your answer but if you only have the placenta from an IUFD and you have this valitis with plasma cells I would work it up with IHC for both okay so another question this is from Facebook it's from Fatima Sali and they ask um, can we make a diagnosis of valitis of unknown etiology based on H and E yeah yeah that's usually what we make it on so um, if you have valitis, you look for all those other features that make you worry about an infectious valitis. So you kind of rule out infection based on H&E and on clinical story, and then you make the diagnosis of VUE. So most, you know, 99% of, of chronic validities are VUE. So you really, you're looking for those rare ones with plasma cells, with chorionic plate thrombi, diffuse sick babies, uh, uh, stillbirths, you know, some, you know, there's something else that twists your arm into thinking that this could be an infectious phyllitis. Right. Okay. And then here's another question that I see on Facebook. It's from uh, Hussam Abu Farsak, and they ask, what are other causes of nucleated red blood cells in villi? So the most common cause is uh, hypoxia. Um, uh, and then it could be anemia for all the millions of causes of anemia in um, pregnancy. Um, but it's the most common cause is hypoxia, subacute um, uh, hypoxia. So, um, but you have to rule out anemia and infections or think about those two if you see nucleated red blood cells after about 22 weeks. So before 22 weeks, it could just be developmental. Excellent. Okay, so those are all the questions that I'm seeing right now. Right. Um, but you know, you'll be happy to know that I mean, you had several hundred concurrent viewers on both Facebook and YouTube, and you know, from all over the world, as you know. I mean, I, I'll name a few countries of that that were listed here in the chat. You know, Lithuania, Nigeria, Peru, Namibia, Brazil, India, France, Mongolia. Um, wow! Welcome, Ecuador. everyone. Yeah. <laughs> And Here, course, I put my email up again. So if you think of questions later, if you have a case you want to share, um, email me. I'm happy to, to answer questions or help out with difficult cases. That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Roberts. And we'll be posting um, a link to the digital slides that you use in case somebody wants to review them again. I mean, they're publicly available on our on our website, on the Mass General website. So again, thank you very much, Dr. Roberts. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Thank you so much.